I'm Matt Davenport. I think most of you know that, but <clears throat> I always like to give the disclaimer. If you don't like what I say, I'm not speaking next week, so just come back. <laughs> um, that also gives me a lot of leniency. This world's obsessed with passive aggressive, and I'm just going to be aggressive this morning. So um, everything I say is meant to be direct. It's not meant to be in a roundabout way. This is like the this is the big disclaimer on the shows that say we do not necessarily agree with the comments. Um, so, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. it. Does go so much better when you guys laugh at my jokes. Um, so, I wrote down a couple of things. I have I have several things, and and to be honest, um, it feels a little bit disorganized um, in terms of like the thought process of how so hopefully God will make sense of all this and it will impact you um, we have five kids we currently have seven sports going on um, which in and of itself is enough and then there's a lot of other stuff so those are again that's kind of a disclaimer about the organization here but I I feel like the word that's continued to come into my heart and my mind for this morning was restoration. Some of the songs Pat sang uh, reflected that, actually. So that's what I really want to talk about is restoration. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. That's Psalm 118, 24. And according to Matthew Henry's commentary on David when he wrote that psalm, it was really when he took the full possession of Israel. David had been on the run after being hunted down for several years by Saul. He was anointed by Samuel as the next king of Israel when he was 15. Over the next 15 years, he was a shepherd. He served Saul as a musician. He saved Israel by killing Goliath. He became a legend due to his mighty conquest in the battlefield. And then today we hear, today is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Do you know that we're separated by David by over 3,000 years? That's a long time. It's a long time to still be referencing someone's life and story. Yet we would look back on his life for encouragement, courage, wisdom, and strength. If your life has been discouraging, if you are discouraged, I would encourage you to take courage in those that have gone before you. I'll tell you just a quick story. That I, I gave a Bible to one of my good friends because I'm such a good Christian. <laughs> um, no, he, he was wanting one, and he didn't have one. And then I gave it to him, and I said, are you reading it? He's like, I tried, but I don't understand it at all. And, um, and so I say that as a bizarre encouragement to you all. Like, if, when you read the Bible, it's, if you don't understand a lot of it, that's not abnormal. I mean, some of them are stories, and it's like, oh, that's a neat story. But if it's some of the nuances, does that work now? Oh, yeah. I need to use my hands, I think. <laughs> All right. It's going to get a lot better after now. Um, thanks for putting up the first couple minutes. How's that? Yeah, I'll just... <laughs> Completely start over. Is that okay? You good? So, I gave, so anyway, if you don't understand it, don't, don't be discouraged like you're not spiritual or maybe you just don't, you're not smart enough. Understanding the Bible is really more of a revelation. It's not a, it don't, don't feel bad. Kids too, if you read the Bible, it can sometimes parts of it feel boring. Um, is that okay to say? Um, it, it, you know why? It's because you don't understand it. You haven't, it hasn't been revealed to you. Don't feel bad about that. Trust the Lord will reveal that over time. But King's Dave, King David's whole story is one of restoration. I think we know, a lot of us know, if you don't, he sinned against the Lord by um, sinning against the Lord, doing some things he shouldn't have done. And as a result, his life was restored, and here we are talking about him today. So David's life, a man after God's own heart, was about restoration. Restoration defined as the act of returning something to a former owner, place, or condition. 
Synonyms for restoration are repair, refurbish, rebuild, mend, fix, and return. Antonyms, so the opposite, for restoration would be neglect, destroy, throw away, and abolish. We live in sort of a non-restoration society, right? Like we build things that are, they're like one-use products. Uh, what do we do? We restore things that are older, like 50 years or whatever, because they were built different. We don't restore, like I don't know that our kids will restore things being built now. Maybe some, but not a lot, because they're more one-time uses. But the Bible is a book of restoration. In Psalm 51, 1, um, verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, this is David, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my, transgression, my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And then skipping down to verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Verse 19, then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burnt offerings. God is a God of restoration. The Bible is a book of restoration. Over the last few months, we have heard the importance of being salt and light. My dad has shared that. Um, Robert Grant last week spoke up about being gaslit into silence. Gaslit means if we can be shamed, isolated, to a point where we don't have an opinion or feel heard, we become silent and ineffective. I spoke last week, and or I, the last time I spoke was April. I usually speak like four or five times a year um, in church here and all over the country and other places. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I actually don't. <laughs> Why is that so funny? Um, that was so not meant to be a joke, but okay. It's hard to believe. No, I only speak here. It's in my contract. I only speak here. Um, but the last time I spoke was in April. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> About, and I spoke about the difference between natural and supernatural. And if you probably all remember exactly what I said, but if you didn't, I'll remind you. In essence, we need to train our minds and our ears to know who's speaking. That was kind of the whole theme, natural versus supernatural. So I wrote these notes down. God says he has grafted you into the kingdom. Satan says you don't fit in here. God says you are right where you're supposed to be. Satan says, you can't break into these long-standing friendships at SEC. God says, I would have sent my, my son if you were the only person alive. Satan said, God only cares about some people. God says, be anxious for nothing. Satan says, be anxious for everything. God says, I will protect you. Satan says, I will kill you. What voice do you recognize? What voice do you hear more often? What voice do you put your trust in? Are you really doomed for failure? Are you worthless? Is your marriage over? Is your relationship really broken? Satan makes, makes you question God's words even right as I'm saying this this morning, you're going through a process in your mind going, I don't know that I hear he, he hates me. And then you're negotiating with yourself. The reality is we hear Satan's voice, the enemy's voice, a lot more than we hear God's voice. It doesn't mean God's not, not speaking to you. It just means we're not hearing him. So in preparation for this morning, I felt the Lord urge me to encourage you. So today, I believe the Lord is saying, he hears you. He hears you. He has heard your prayers. He hears your crying out. 
He hears you. He's hearing you. If you were, if you were to, to restore a car, right? Like, I'm not a car guy. I totally wish I was a car guy. Like, I'm not. I always feel like I don't. I mean, I have like a, a pretty nice Explorer. I'm just saying, it's pretty nice. Um, but I'm like, I, I don't really deserve a real nice car because I don't value cars that much. Some of you do. This doesn't tie in at all. I just felt like I needed to tell you that. Um, so if you see me driving in a nicer car than I deserve, I'm probably having a midlife crisis. So <laughs> let me know. Keep me on track. A little convertible Miata rolling around here. Um, <laughs> I always said I wanted to share a midlife crisis with a bunch of guys in here. Like, we don't go full, but we do something like that. We split a Miata just to... <laughs> and then we sell it to get over the... <laughs> You're in? I got one. Larry, Ty. <laughs> I got some thumbs down, too. <laughs> um... Whose voices am I telling you right now? No, just, um, so, but if you were to restore a car, I think I was going through that process. Like, what if I did want to restore a car? And I would love to restore a car if I was what I was. Um, I would ask, first, I would want to ask myself, why do I want to do this? Right? Because you see, there's a, where the Braves and I live, uh, there's some cars in desperate need of restoration. <laughs> Not the Braves cars. The, but there's some on the side of the road, but you drive by, like, I bet that's a pretty cool car. Like, back in the day, right? Like, that was a cool car. But it's been sitting there for, like, 50 years and doesn't move. But the first thing I would want to ask myself is, why do I want to restore that car? The second thing I, I think if I was to restore that car, I'd say, what would be the designer's intent when this car was full, first built? Because I don't want to restore a car to what I want it to be. I want to restore a car for what the original intent of that designer was. Three, I would ask myself, does this item have value? Like, if I do this, is there value in it? Is there any value in this relative worthless piece of junk sitting on the side of the road? And then will the work be worth it? So I just made these notes that restoration requires vision, right? Like we are in a process of restoration as a, as, as a humanity. That is why Jesus came back, was to restore. It requires vision. So you think of that, to make it simple, think of that car, but also know that I'm talking about us. It requires vision. So I could see that car in its finished state. That gets me excited. That's what I want. That's why I want to do it. I want to restore that car. Two, I have hope for that car. I have hope that I could get it through this, like onto the jacks and through the paint and buff it out. <laughs> Getting closer. Change the oil, hydraulic fluid. There's tons of hydraulic fluid in those old cars. Um, but you need hope. It requires sacrifice. It is going to talk, cost me time, money, energy. I think a big piece is going to require collaboration. Because what I don't know that there's a lot of joy in restoring an old car by yourself. Like nobody ever saw the first version. You all live in homes and some of, some of you have done renovations. The best part is seeing it before and then seeing it after. All the shows, right? Here's the before, here's the after. If they just showed you the after, it's like, I don't get it. They have to show you the before. So it requires collaboration for restoration. For, hey, come on over. Let's take the tires off together. Let's, let's work on this together. Do you know where we can find this part? Oh, there's an old junkyard. Like, it requires other people for restoration to be complete. And then it requires memory. Because through restoration, at some point, you're going to get really, really discouraged. Like, this is not worth it. This is so not worth it. And then you have to hearken back to your first vision of going, no, I can picture that car. I can picture my life. And then that gets you through and kind of over the hump. 
God is in the process of restoring each and every one of us. I'm not talking about somebody outside this room. I'm talking about us. If you think you've been restored, you're probably arrogant. You are in the restoration process. You have been purchased. God has a vision for you. He sees value in you. Even in your rusty condition, some of you have been sitting on the side of the road in Tribuco Canyon for a long time. You were really nice looking a long time ago. And, but God has the vision for you. He bought you because you're worth it, even in your current state, because he sees you as you were first intended. He sacrificed his son to restore you. He gets us involved. He gets a community involved. That's the collaboration part. Many years ago, I was going through a time that I didn't feel like the Lord was hearing me. This feeling leads to wondering and despair. And it's in Psalm 13. It says, this is when David was writing in a time of need, but how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Some of you are right here today. How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? Day after day, sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me. Answer, Lord my God, give, me to my eye, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. The Lord has not forgotten you. The enemy is gaslighting to you, making you, pushing you into corner into believing that this country is doomed. He's actively doing that. He's telling you the world is doomed. And he's, he's really focusing on that your prayers aren't heard. The enemy is actively trying to get us to discount who God is and if he really cares about us. Are we playing make-believe here or are we serving the living God? Do you all understand what I'm saying? That he is pushing us to a corner because of what's happening nationally, internationally, for you to start believing your prayers aren't working. Because your prayers don't matter. Because you know why? Things keep getting worse. That's the equation, right? It keeps getting worse. My prayers aren't, they're not working. The Lord God Almighty wants you to know this morning he is listening, that he is active, that he has his best interest in mind, not yours. We, we spend most of our life asking God to fulfill our plan instead of listening to his. Yesterday at the park, or yeah, yesterday, we had, there was one of the seven games, and uh, there's two parks, and I took Ren, Ren was our two-year-old, she's like, park, park, you know, so you got to take her to the park. And there's two parks, one small, age-appropriate, one big, not age-appropriate. Which park do you think she wanted to go to? Little park, age-appropriate and empty. Big park, very active and not age-appropriate for her. And I was like, man, we all want to play in the big park before we're ready. And she's about to get run over by kids, and she's like totally oblivious. I'm more anxious than I should be watching this whole thing. But we all want to play in the big park before we're ready because it looks more fun, more exciting, and more dangerous. And you know what? It is more fun. It is more exciting. And it is more dangerous. But there's a time when we get to play in the big park. It's no coincidence that the Gallup recently, the Gallup poll reached, reported in March of this year that those attending the church was down below the majority for the first time in the nation's history, or since they've been recording this since 1937. 47% of Americans say they were members of a church. In 1999, that number was 70. I believe a large reason for this is that because most churchgoers go to church for God. Church is a critical discipline in our walks with Christ, but if you have not spoken with him since last Sunday, you're missing the best part. Church 
is a sports analogy, a football analogy to be specific. Church is the huddle. We come up here, we come in here to draw up plays. John, where are you guys going? How you doing? You checking in? Everybody come on in. Okay. The game happens at 11 o'clock outside of this huddle. The huddle has become the game for most Americans. We have to understand that we are here to support each other, uh, each other on Sunday morning, but that the real game happens outside these walls. Most of us have never been touched. Remember I said I wasn't going to be passive aggressive, I'd just be aggressive. So most of us have never been touched by the Holy Spirit. Touched in a way that gives you self-assuredness in the face of difficulties. We've had experiences, but when we lay our life down, when we move across country by hearing his voice to establish a church that's thriving 41 years later, that's different. It's different in that it gets you through tough times. Today is the day the Lord has made. Over the past few years, our church, the church, has been pruned back and become smaller, in my opinion, more nimble and more powerful. I love that the enemy thinks he's, by getting 47% of the church, people to church, that he's making it worse. He's just thinning the herd. That's what the, enemy, that's what the Lord is doing. He's sifting. I love this verse in Galatians 5, 9. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Not a lot of yeast, a little yeast. We, t- we can talk about the, f- the, the boy with the fish and the loaves. Not a lot of food for a lot of people. In Matthew, for where two or three are gathered, there I am with you. Not two or three thousand. I mean, two or three thousand in here would be awesome, but where two or three is what he said, he's there. That's not a lot of people. James 3, talking about ships, although they are very large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder where the pilot wants to go. Talks about in Matthew, faith of a mustard seed, the smallest seed. Everything the Lord does that ends up in growth and kingdom impact always is small. But we're obsessed with large. We love, because if you're not growing, you're dying. If we're not, we don't have this or we don't have that, then this, not be, this must not be real. But I believe what, the, what God's doing is pruning is always followed by growth. Always. Typically explosive growth. Typically uncontrollable growth. And the group that is smaller now has to be disciplined and serious about what God's saying to you so you're able to, be, to co-labor alongside him to help disciple the growth. Growth in and of itself is not productive. Purposeful growth, growth set aside, restorative growth is what God's after. Gideon is a good example. Gideon's a story. He had 24,000 soldiers. That's a good that's a good team. The Lord said to him, now anyone of this army, anyone who trembles in fear, send them back to me. So 22,000 men left. That's 2,000 left. And then the Lord said to Gideon, there's, there's still too many. Gideon's in charge going, mm. <laughs> even if these guys aren't great, they could take some arrows in front of me. I, you know, so he sent him down to the river, and any of the soldiers that lapped the water, they didn't have their head on a swivel. They weren't looking around. They weren't, like, ready for battle. He said, send him home. He was left with 300. That's not bigger. In Jeremiah, and I won't read it, but, well, I'll just read a little bit of it. Jeremiah 33 um, He says, I'll bring health. He's talking about the nation. I will heal my people. I will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. I will bring Judah and Israel back from captivity. I will cleanse them from all the sin they have committed. Then this city will bring me renown, joy, praise, and honor for all nations on earth. They will live in awe and tremble at the abundant prosperity and peace I provided for it. The Lord is restoring something in the church. 
When the numbers are down, don't mistake that for him not restoring it. Don't mistake that for your prayers not working. He's restoring it, and to restore it, you got to get small. So we're doing a good job of staying small, too, here. That's what we do. We stay small. We stay nimble. I have a small business. We do the same. You can make decisions fast. Think of, you, think of this church body as special forces in the military. They don't send big groups of people to get people out of, in dire situations, out of Afghanistan, out of different places. They send small groups, trained groups, committed groups, people that have been tested that can't be talked out of their loyalty type of groups. So I will close with this. You are being restored. You are worth the restoration. This is the Lord's voice. This is not the enemy's voice that says you're not worth the restoration. You are worth the restoration. You are being restored. You are one of a kind, one of one, which makes you incredibly valuable. You are damaged. You are rusty. You have been sitting in a parking lot for years. But he sees you as you are. He sees you as your intended design. He designed you for a very specific purpose. If you haven't been fulfilling that, you're in the restoration process. It doesn't mean you're a failure. It just, needs you, it, it just needs, means you need to submit to being restored. The value you put on yourself has nothing to do with the value, with your actual value. I think a lot of times we give so much credence to our own opinion. It's like, I see that in work all the time. Or talking to different people, like, I don't know, I just don't. It's like, no, everything I've ever done, I've faked it until it's worked. I mean, you have to walk into situations like if you're not walking into situations stretched, like if you're not feeling that, I feel it every, I'm right now this morning, every day feels stretched. That's a huge opportunity for the Lord to fill in the gaps. But we put our opinion like I could never do that. Oh, I, I don't know. I didn't go to that school or I didn't have that on my resume. It's like, the guy is interviewing you because he thinks you're qualified. What does your opinion have to do with it? And it's the same for the Lord. I don't really care about your opinion, and neither does he. It's about his opinion. It's about who he says you are. It's about who, how much he says you're worth. It's not about how much you've sinned. You guys, we got to stop putting value on our own opinions. Our past experiences like King David, is part of the beauty and the restoration. We just, as a community, we get to collaborate and watch the before picture. We're all a bunch of before pictures. And then in the process, when we end up in, in heaven, I, I think we're going to see a lot of afters. So that's my encouragement this morning, that the Lord hears you. Your prayers are not going unanswered. Don't let the culture tell you they are. Don't, it's not true. God is he's refining in the process. He's making us smaller so we can be more tactical and powerful. So be encouraged that God hears you and that he's in the restoration process. Amen. <clears throat>
as you are. There's joy. There's joy for the morning. Sin and be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow heaven can heal. Lay down. So lay Lay down your hurt. 